My name is Alex Ficarra. I'm a professor of orthopedics and neurosurgery from Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, USA. I've been honored to have the ability to be the chairman of the AO Knowledge Forum Fracture Group. We have focused on various issues that are important to spinal surgeons, and in that, we decided that it's important to come together to come up with a unified classification system. The AO system is sort of the background of this entire system. You have compression injuries, which are called A, distraction injuries, which are called B, and translational injuries, which are called C. We remove the description of rotation because surgeons in the past have had a very difficult time determining if something's rotated or not. We felt translation was the most significant morphologic appearance of an injury that would really stress how unstable an injury was, so we left it as translation. In the A injuries, there are five subtypes. A vertebral body either has no injury or an insignificant injury, and that would be A0. It could be a transverse process or a spinous process fracture without any significant ligamentous disruption. You could have a simple compression fracture, that's A1. You could have a coronal plane fracture where the body separated a typical pincer fracture, and we called that A2. Or you could have a burst fracture. You could either have a single end plate involved, either su the superior or inferior, and that would be an A3. Or you can have both end plates involved, and that would be an A4. The distraction injuries are more severe than the A-type injuries, and you're really focusing on significant separation of the spinal elements. You could have a B1 fracture where it's a distraction through bone alone, but the ligamentous complex is not disrupted. You could have an injury where you have bony and ligamentous or all ligamentous, and that would be a B2, and that's much more unstable. Or you can have a distraction extension injury, which is B3, which we often see in the setting of DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, or ankylosing spondylitis. And the last subgroup is C. We don't have C1, C2, C3. We thought that C would be the most important. That means there's translation. The second you have a B-type injury, distraction extension, that translates, it's called a C first, then a B. You can have an A fracture with any translation it's a C, then an A. We felt it was unnecessary to make a C1, C2, C3 because it gets the point across and it'll encourage physicians to be much more aggressive in their treatment of these injuries. Now, what is new to this system is that we've given a neurologic status modifier. N0 means the patient's neurologically intact. N1 is a common scenario. You receive a history that the patient had Weakness in the field, but over 10, 15 minutes, the weakness went away. And that would be N1, because when you're examining the patient, they're neurologically intact. N2, they come in complaining of leg pain. They have a pinched nerve. They have no involvement of the spinal cord or cord equina, and that would be an N2. And N3 is an incomplete spinal cord injury patient, which is much more severe, or cord equina syndrome. And an N4 means the patient has a complete spinal cord injury. Sometimes patients come in intubated, they're in a coma, they're not moving, it may be chemically induced, and you have no idea what the neurologic status is, and we give that an NX, which is very important because that may, in some ways, affect the way we manage a patient. We may have to be more aggressive not knowing a patient's neurologic exam, so it's important to let everyone know this patient can't be examined neurologically, and we put NX. Now, there's modifiers. If you have a distraction injury through the soft tissue, we call that a B2. We can call it a B3 with a C modifier. Sometimes you get an MRI scan and you really can't tell if the soft tissue sleeve is disrupted. If it is, it may make it an unstable injury. If it's not, it may be a stable burst fracture. So we allow the surgeon to put a modifier if they think there may be a ligamentous disruption, but they're not sure. That would be an M1. There's certain comorbidities a patient may have which makes them potentially very unstable with any type of fracture, no matter how benign the fracture is. And we see that with ankylosing spondylitis or stiffening spine disease. In that situation, another modifier would be appended, and that would be M2. When you hear M2 ankylosing spondylitis, you have to be very, very careful with that patient because any slightest movement may cause a neurologic problem. Our next step in this classification is to validate it. We need to do that by sending case examples throughout the world to get a flavor on do people agree with the different a classifications, B classifications, C classifications. Did we miss anything? Do they think there should be others? And then we have to prospectively look at 
how we classify these injuries and how it correlates with treatment. To do that, we need to come up with an injury severity score. What we learned through the TLIC system is that different societies give more weight to certain injuries than others. So we have to validate these injury severity scores throughout the six regions of the world that the AO works with at the present time. That'll get us to a position where we can reliably, reliably come up with a treatment that is predictive of outcome. That's our final goal. I want to present to you today several cases to sort of illustrate exactly how the system works. If you look at this fracture present, you'll notice that the L1 vertebral body has an injury to the superior end plate and the posterior body is involved. The inferior end plate is not involved. So that would be a burst fracture, which makes it an A3 or A4, but only the superior end plate is involved, and therefore we would call that an A3. So a surgeon would call their particular partner up and say, I have in the emergency room a patient with an L1, A3, and you would then give the neurologic modifier and any of the modifiers that exist. For purposes of this presentation, we'll focus only on the morphologic classification. In this example, if you look at the AP view, you see significant coronal plane translation between the L1 and L2 body. That would automatically be a C injury. So the surgeon says C, we know it's an extremely unstable injury. Now you can get into more details of the description and look at the L1 or L2 vertebral body, and you notice the L1 vertebral body is intact, but the L3 vertebral body has a burst component involving only one end plate, and therefore that would be an A3. So you would call that an L1, 2, C-type injury, L2, A3, which means incomplete injury. In this example, if you look closely at the T11, 12 level, you have a distraction injury. But it's more than just soft tissue. You can see that the line goes through the vertebral body itself. And that depends on where the fulcrum of rotation is. If the fulcrum of rotation is anterior to the anterior longitudinal ligament, you'll just have a distraction injury. But if the fulcrum is at the vertebral body itself, you may have a burst component, which can be very different in the way someone manages this patient. So because it's the distraction injury that involves both ligament and bone, it's a B2. And then if you look closely at the vertebral body, there is a burst component that involves one end plate, so that would be an A3. So you would describe this as a T1112 B2 with a burst component of T12. The final example is one of the more serious injuries that you see in a patient with a bone stiffening disease, and that's a distraction extension injury. You can see that that exists between a T4 and T5 vertebral body. So that would be a B3. That's a distraction extension injury. And you look very closely at the posterior elements. If there's any type of translation, it would be called a C B3. If it just hinges alone, it's a B3. It's difficult in distraction extension injuries to get, to get into further description of the vertebral body because oftentimes you do not have a compression or burst component, often not, so we don't go beyond the B3 description. So in summary, what I presented to you is the new AO knowledge form thoracolumbar injury classification. I hope you will find this useful in your management of patients and hopefully over time we can validate this to make our treatments safer and more appropriate for patients that we manage in our daily lives. Thank you.